Marriage on a Tightrope is a podcast that explores how couples can strengthen their relationship when one spouse experiences a shift in religious beliefs. Welcome to Marriage on a Tightrope. I am Alan. And I'm Katie. And we're still married. It's a special episode today, Katie. It is. What day is it? Well... Yeah, here's the thing. Not everyone's going to listen on the day that it's released, but we are releasing on Valentine's Day. So today is all, this episode rather, is all about love. And if you're listening today, happy Valentine's. Happy Valentine's. If you're not listening today, shame on you. <laughs> listen the day it's released. How dare you? Just kidding. Just kidding. Before we get into our, our topic, which is centered all around love... We do want to give you a little update. We actually have two of five baked good uh, redemptions. We do. We had a really fun night last weekend. We went out with two couples who have listened to our podcast, and it was so fun. It was awesome. Yeah. Honestly, I don't want. We don't want to say their names right here. So shout out to you four who <laughs> we know are listening. It was. Let me tell you this, and this is a good example of why it's important to to understand there are people out there experiencing the same thing. It was therapeutic, cathartic. Is that the right word? Yeah. Sure. sure it's a word. It's, sure. It makes me sound smart, even though I don't know what it means. Now I'm admitting that publicly. <laughs> but it was so helpful. And we. it was so funny because we sat down and we went around the table and we said each other's names. And then from then on, it was just, let's dive into the deep end. And it yeah. was... Two and a half hours or so of just deep conversations of how we're dealing with things, where we're at. It was awesome. It was really great. Yeah. And there's, I mean, we didn't go for all the surface stuff. In fact, it was towards the end of the dinner that we started talking about surface things. What are, what do we watch? What do we like to do? Et cetera, et cetera. It was so nice to visit with others and not do the surface thing. Just dive right in. If you're listening out there, there are so many couples just like you and your spouse. And it was nice to see two other couples who are also making it work and they're not resorting to divorce. I think that if anything, it was very uplifting to see two other couples who were really committed to each other and that were just as in love as Alan and I are. Mm, schmoopy. The, the the cool thing that I like to point out with that with that dinner is that they've been going through this for longer than we have. And what I like about what you just said, Katie, is you didn't say they're trying to make it work. They're making it work. They don't agree on everything. Uh, one of the couples is a little bit more aligned than the other, it seems. They they aren't trying to make it work. It's working. So that's a really hopeful way of thinking about it. So thank you again for that amazing dinner. And by the way, Sawadi is the Thai place we went. If you're in Salt Lake, yeah, we're it not was really huge good. Thai fans, but it was it was very good. Oh, let me do a Bill real impression. Okay. And now to what you've been waiting to hear, or something. He's that's what he says when he gets done with the like the announcements at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> Let's get into today's topic, which is. Valentine's Day, it's all about love and love. loving each other. Katie, with as far as love goes, what's the first thing that you want to talk about? I don't think we've really talked about our story. We've mentioned on the show that we met as missionaries, but I think that it's important for this episode to go a little bit deeper about what that entails. So Alan and I, we met the first day at the MTC. May 8th, 2002. We were in the same district. Alan, I mentioned this before, was my district leader. And there were, it was a small group. There were seven of us. Yep. We had three weeks in the MTC in Provo, and then we were shipped out to Madrid for the last six weeks of our training. Over that time, now I always joke because at the beginning of the MTC experience, my companion had a real tough time with Alan. <laughs> she felt like he was like kind of a show off and... Well, I am. Yeah. I mean, she's not wrong. <laughs> and so I would naturally, being the good companion that I am, I took her side. And so I just supported her and her feelings against Alan. And you couldn't resist me for forever, though, could you? (laughs) (laughs) Obviously not. We didn't get along very well. I mean, I I think you and I got along along fine. But I did think that he was a little bit of a show off. He was young. And I was, of course, a year older. So that made me more 
wise. More mature. That's right. But then when we got to the Madrid MTC, things changed and we became really good friends. Yeah. Remember we would trade, you had a hand lotion that was like a cucumber melon mm-hmm. and I Back had, and body works. I had Carmex mm-hmm. and we would exchange the two and it was kind of our little inside, it wasn't an inside thing. May This may be coming off more flirty than we're meaning it to. Right. We <laughs> do actually have a picture of us trading those two things. We do. We do. You know when you sign your missionary journal with all the people as you're leaving the MTC or being transferred from areas to area? That's what we did. We drew the Carmex container and the, the lotion bottle in the journal. Right. Anyway, symbolic. Alan definitely had a crush on me. Shut up. Um, <laughs> no, my heart was locked, yo. Here's where the story turns interesting, because really, Katie wasn't the only one that we had good relationships with, right? There's other elders that were awesome. There are other sisters that were awesome, and it was great. Even the sister that we at first didn't get along with, we ended up getting along really well, and it was really good. Yeah. So where it got interesting was when we went from the plane from Madrid, MTC, to Barcelona. And while we were on the plane, Katie and I happened to be have tickets and seats right next to each other. So we're sitting next to each other and she starts asking me questions about some of the things that had happened before the mission. And I'm answering these questions and they were, I had shared with my district that I had some, I mean, I talk about vulnerability. I had some worthiness issues and my mission was actually delayed. I received my mission call and had to resubmit it after I had already been issued my call. I ended up going to the same place, but it was about nine months later. And she was asking me questions about, hey, when did this happen? When did you talk to your bishop? When did this? When did this? The timeline questions. And I was answering them like, why do you care so much? And she was getting all emotional about it. Like, oh my gosh, I knew that. Oh my gosh, I knew it. I can't believe this. Like, What are you talking about? Later on, we get to the mission home. We take a little tour of Barcelona with the mission president. We went on a train and we both happened to be going to the southern part of Spain. And we were on the same train. And of course, now our train tickets are right next to each other as well. So we're talking more about this and she writes in my journal let's just say that i had a priesthood blessing before the mission and now i understand what it was all about and i'm like that is seriously i'm going to be left on that cliffhanger for two years really and so anyway the rest of the mission we kind of forgot about it of course we're not going to dwell okay, on so it so let me tell you my part of the story. But I just want to make sure everyone knows right. that we served good, honorable missions. We didn't let that hang over our heads. We didn't let that distract us. Okay, so let me tell you what's going on in my head, though. Okay, go ahead. So I, when I was at the MTC in Madrid, I kid you not, I was sitting there studying in the hallway, and a thought came to my head, which I 100% believe it was from God, and it said, that's who you're going to marry meaning Alan. And it's probably the way the light was hitting my blue eyes or something. You weren't even I was on my floor. You weren't even around. Oh wow. Well. And I was really mad. I was really mad at the the thought that came into my head because I thought to myself, why in the world would this come up before my mission? That was maddening to me. Also, I was a little bit like who are you to tell me who I'm going to marry? I mean, it was like a I'm little... I'm a strong, independent woman. I'll choose who I want to choose. That's right. It was a little re- kind of like a rebellious reaction. Now, to go back before my mission, there was a time where I was offered a job to go um, teach English down in Mexico or Peru. I can't remember where it was. It was in South America. And it coincided with the time I was turning 21. And so it was a little bit of a... You, I'm either going to go on a mission or I'm going to go teach English. Anyway, I was trying to make that decision and I had a, a really good home teacher and I so I asked him for a blessing. And so uh, in his blessing, he one thing he said was that my future husband was really struggling at this time to stay worthy, to take me to the temple and that I needed to pray for him. And I was like really confused. I, that didn't give me an answer as to what I should do. I ended up making the decision, of course, to go on a mission. It was just so weird to me. I had no idea what it meant. When I had that prompting at, or that idea that I was going to marry Alan, I kind of thought about like, okay, well, what was his timeline? Cause he had mentioned that he was being, he had been delayed before the mission 
And I didn't know why, and I didn't. He didn't go into any specifics, and so ga- gambling addiction. <laughs> That's what it was. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, like a teenager has a hundred bucks. Sticking. That's to my spend. story, and I'm sticking with it. Anyway, on the plane, of course, curios- curiosity killed the cat. That's like me. I just kept asking questions, and it just happened to perfectly align with the timing of my blessing and what I was going through. So I didn't tell him anything. I was really like upset and shaken and I was mad. I just wanted to focus on the next year and a half. And I didn't understand like why I would have these feelings or thoughts before all of this. Cause I mean, isn't that wrong? (laughs) I mean, the mission president it, our mission present was very much very strict about lock your heart, right? When we, when we went to uh, the first mission reunion with him afterwards, but he, we shook his hand and he, and he looks. Were we married or were we about to get I married? Think he, we were engaged. I think we were engaged, and he looked at us and remember what he said? What happened? <laughs> And we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> and then, of course, Alan sticks his foot in his mouth and said, President, we only kissed once. We only kissed once, President. Oh, my god. And he gosh. looked mortified. I'm like, I'm kidding. Nothing happened. Come on. Anyway, it was it was pretty funny. We go through our missions. It just so happens that we're never in the same area, but we're always transferred to the adjoining area. So I see him most of the mission just randomly at conferences or every once in a while the zones will get together and do something. So, I mean, I didn't really see you on a regular basis, but I just saw you every once in a while. Yeah, every few months. I didn't see your companion from the MTC once. The right. entire mission. Right, which was, it was a little, it was odd. Anyway, so I go home and I write to my entire district. I mean, it wasn't just Alan. It was the sisters I served with, the other elders I served with. Alan still has, you know, six months left of his mission. And so I'm home and I'm dating other people. And and then Alan gets towards the end of his mission. Yeah, and then in, what happens? It was in January, leaving in May. And so four months before the end, I got recruited by the BYU volleyball team. And it was a really, the only few hours that I didn't, that I took off from proselyting was to pray and think and decide if I wanted to stay at UCLA or go to BYU. And I made the decision to go to BYU. Um, now, while he makes this decision, I get a letter in the mail saying that I'm accepted to BYU Because I had transferred from UVU. Not even joking. I write him a letter saying that I'm going to BYU. And he writes me a letter saying that he's going to be playing volleyball at BYU. And literally, it crossed in the air. and The the planes touched wings (laughs) as they crossed the Atlantic. But within a couple of days of each other, we both got letters saying, Hey, I'm going to be be at BYU BYU." together at the same time. Suddenly it was, oh... This maybe this is uh, may, I don't think it, it was a conscious thought, but maybe this is something that is now physically possible because we're going to be in the same university. Fast forward to the end of my mission, and I actually was going home to a non member. We weren't dating beforehand, but we had written throughout the mission and we had decided we were going to date when I got back. And her name was also Katie. And I literally got a Dear John letter the day that I left the mission field. That said, I'm back with my ex-boyfriend. Like, sorry, I'll still come to the airport. And I said, how dare you? So I was close to the mission president. I was serving in in the uh, Barcelona area at the time. So I actually went and talked to the mission president and just mentioned to him, Katie Dear John'd me. Because I had been talking to him about advice for going back and dating and whatnot. And he said, oh, that's that's a shame. I'm so sorry. Just so you know, there's, a, there's another Katie out there that would be dying to date you. I like that he's used the word die. Now this is a new mission president, <laughs> not the one that was that was Lock what happened. His, he was actively encouraging us, right, to to date. And I was literally on my last day of my mission, so no biggie. So that was a very interesting thing as well. So there was all of these things that aligned that made it feel and look very inspired, like it was meant to be. I didn't feel like it took agency out of the equation at all, but it was, it definitely felt inspired. So this is fun. I was actually in California with a friend, a a former uh, mission companion, and we were in Southern California. We had gone to Disneyland. We had done a few things and it just so happened that Alan was coming home that weekend. you planned it. 
Hold on. You knew I was coming no. home. No, okay. You now, planned the trip. I, I knew that you were coming home. However, we had no way of getting up to Santa Barbara. We were down in Anaheim, and one night we went with my cousin to an Angels game. And I kid you not, we're walking up just to our seats, and all of a sudden we hear our names being yelled. We turn, and there is a former companion of Alan's. Or did you live with him? Uh, yeah, we we weren't companions, but we were together for they were together. three or four transfers. And he was sitting in the section that we were at the baseball game. He said to us, hey, are you going to Alan's homecoming? And I said, well, I, I would like to, but we don't have a ride. And he's like, oh, I'm going up. I'll give you a ride, and then I'll take you to the airport after. Because it was kind of a close close time where we had to be back. Anyway, and so, hello. I mean, that's – that. You, I mean, how was – so there can be a lot of people listening right now. I know. And, I know. Confirmation and you really, bias. And confirmation bias. That's a good term. So right. you really can, you can look at this as a string of coincidences. Mm -hmm. You can look at it as inspiration combined with some coincidences that helped it along. Right. And I, I'm not asking this record rhetorically. Does it matter? To you. I don't think it matters to me. However, I feel like God's hand was in it. I don't think that it was all a coincidence. I don't. The I, whole process, I don't feel like was a coincidence. Right. This is like, I think actually after we got married and we told a few people our story, they were like, oh my gosh, this is a youth fireside story. <laughs> and it, I mean, and now of course I have a different outlook on it, but. So, so let me ask you this. Okay. What were the concerns about us getting together the way that we did when my faith crisis started to happen? Did you have any concerns? Yes. I think that I I was worried that because of the feelings that you had about about the church that you wouldn't have thought how we met was actually inspired if it was just all coincidence. That I was maybe I was spiritual manipulation not from you but what what had happened I had maybe now that I felt differently spiritually, I felt maybe I was painted into a corner and I didn't really choose you. Right. Or that you felt like it wasn't inspired or you thought that maybe I was worried that you wouldn't look the same at our story like you had mm -hmm. before. It was different. And maybe you would feel differently about me. Right. That's That was scary yeah. because we have felt like I had felt that had been inspired all along. And then you go through a faith crisis and it's like, oh, well, do you still love me after all of this? And do you still believe we were meant to be together? Or was it just all a coincidence? Right. That was hard. And we have talked about the whole idea of soulmates and the idea of, is there one person for somebody? And from the beginning, even well before a faith crisis, I certainly have said, no, I mean, there's, there are so many people you could be, Katie, you could be happy with a lot of people m being married mm -hmm. to a lot of different people. So could I, I don't, I don't feel like there is a one person, just one person for someone else. I think it's a comforting idea, but I don't think mm -hmm. in reality that's the case. However, this is one of the experiences, our matchmaking from heaven experience that I talked about in a previous episode. I wrote down this experience when I was reminding myself of God's hand in my life. And I do recognize it as more than us, as divinely inspired. Uh, I feel that way, even if I don't fully believe the way that I used to. I still feel like, no, that's, there's just, I choose to believe that was more than coincidence. Could I be wrong? Yeah, but man, it really doesn't feel that way. And it certainly doesn't affect the way that I feel about you at all. I mean, that, that, experience actually helps me remember what's important. We got to the homecoming and I think Alan and I both knew that something was going to happen. He took a few trips up to Utah over the summer before he went to BYU and he stayed at my house and it was quick. We, we knew right away that it worked really well. Yeah. <laughs> he proposed in August and we were married at the end of December after the semester was over. So about six and a half, six months or so after I got home. Right. It was quick, uh, yeah, it was. but it worked for us. Yeah, it absolutely did. So there's a little bit more into how we got together 
and how, man, you have a faith crisis, especially one that, that can lead to a disbelief in God. That would make someone in Katie's shoes feel really vulnerable having an experience like we just shared. And I don't think it has to be exactly this big crazy experience like we had with the mission, but I mean, it could be as easy as meeting someone in a singles ward or having someone in their same class, a a BYU class. I mean, it could be anything sort of in that realm of related to the gospel or, you know, you start there and then the one spouse moves apart. And that can be difficult because what if your meeting and you getting together wasn't inspired? That's, that's kind of a hard thing to deal with. Right. And to feel right. right, I think this naturally leads to the next topic. And I didn't discuss why. I mean, Katie's looking at the agenda, but she doesn't know why this question is here and what point I'm trying to make. So we'll see if your answers uh, <laughs> go along with what I'm trying to explain no here. No pressure. I know. So the next point is, I want to ask you, how do you know that I love you? You tell me. Okay, so I tell you. You. Show me love by what you do. And what do I do? Well, your love language is, you know, physical. Physical touch. <laughs> touch. Okay. You'd rather spend time with me than anyone else. And so that tells me that you love me. Uh, any other ways? I'm not fishing. I just want to make sure that you have a chance to think about it. And I mean, the interaction that you have with the kids. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> no, those are good. So you've said, uh, I tell you. Right. I touch you. <laughs> um, yes. I want to spend time with you. Yes. And I have good interactions with our kids. The, okay, now that I'm thinking of it, the other thing is that we're intimate, not in the physical way, but... Well, we are, but go ahead. <laughs> yes, we are. However, I'm speaking in a personal relationship way. Mm-hmm. So... Throughout the day, Alan will text me or I'll text him. How's your day? Miss you. Thinking of you. That's a very intimate way to connect yeah. without being together. Yeah. I and like that, that that tells me that you love me. Well, thank you. Yeah. Here's why I wanted to ask the question. Okay. And it worked perfectly. <laughs> what you, I passed. <laughs> you passed. What you just described to me has nothing to do with any belief in anything. No belief in God no belief in the church. You know that I love you because of how I treat you and what I say to you. That shouldn't be impacted by any belief that I have. It shouldn't be. It is really easy for it to be impacted. Like we just explained with the story of we got together. When I have shifting beliefs, it's very easy to think, oh my gosh, does he not feel the same way about me? But when you really stop to think about how we treat each other, how we talk to each other, how we just long to be together. We're texting each other throughout the day, our commitment to the kids, the hard work we go to uh, both at home and at work. Like that is what is a really good reminder of, of how we know we love each other. So if you're out there, we got an email. The reason why I thought of this is we got an email from someone yesterday that said, can you address the, the issue of when, when a spouse no longer believes in anything? You know, you and Katie, it seems like it's a little easier because you believe in God still, Alan. But what if you don't? Like, I don't. And that's hard for my wife. And I've thought about that. And and I wholeheartedly agree with him that it is harder. But it doesn't have to be a nail in the coffin. If you really stop to think about what defines love between me and my spouse, how do I know that he loves me? I did not tee that question up to Katie. I didn't prep her for it. Nothing about her definition of how she knows she loves me has anything to do with my beliefs. It doesn't mean that beliefs aren't important and common ground isn't important. Of course not. Of course that's important. But I show my love to Katie through action. And she can look at the last year of this faith transition for me and know that no part of this is me pushing her to the side. I'm only pulling her closer. I, wow. I like that. Do you remember how one time you described it as you felt like you were falling and you didn't know what to grab onto? Right. And then what did you say? 
Yeah, I, I felt like when discovering all these things and my kind of my faith structure collapsing, I felt like I was falling. And you have a decision to make there of what am I going to grab onto? I can grab onto a number of different things and not just one thing. Some people may say, well, I no longer think it's wrong to drink. I'm going to grab onto alcohol. And we talked at our dinner with this couple. They they have multiple examples of people that they don't know how to have a healthy relationship with alcohol after they decide that it's not wrong. And so they develop a very unhealthy relationship with alcohol. That's not me saying don't drink. That's me saying oh, you can make that decision to grab onto something and it, that can be unhealthy. Whether it was a conscious decision or not, and probably a combination of both, I grabbed onto Katie and I grabbed her tight. Didn't mean that I was taking her along with me on this faith crisis. It was, man, this is really hard for me. I, I need someone to support me on this. And she was the one that I wanted to help, help support me. She wasn't the only person that I talked to. I talked to other people that are going through the same thing. That's certainly important as we've talked about, but primarily Katie was the one that I wanted to, to grab both physically and both literally and figuratively. <laughs> so when I think back to the full year of the faith crisis too, all of you know about love languages and how you both receive and give love. And it's been interesting because I've always been service oriented. Alan, you love me. Do the do dishes. The dishes. <laughs> or I, I, we still have a magnet that I gave Katie when we were first married before we had kids. And it's still on our fridge today and says, I, I like hugs. I like dishes. But what I no. really need. No, oh, I, I like love hugs. hugs. I like kisses. What I really need is help with, help the, with dishes. the dishes. <laughs> that's right. Because that is my love language. And I also like to give service. That's that's who I am. However, through the process, I've noticed that I have really needed words of affirmation, which I never had before. I have never needed that verbal communication. But all of a sudden, now not knowing where we stand all the time, I told Alan, I need you to continually tell me, I am with you. I love you. I'm in it for the long haul. Nothing has changed yeah. in my love for you. And for some reason, that's, that's what I, what I've needed. And he's been able to give that to me. And so I, I would just suggest think about maybe in your own relationship, what is it that you're needing? Yeah, from your partner communi communicate that. and you communicate it because it probably has changed for for us. It changed when you recognize that and then you get those words of affirmation or whatever it may be from your spouse. It, it just helps so much with the process. That was a big deal when you <laughs> asked me to do that because Katie is very independent. She's very much a, no, I can do this by myself. And that still creates waves for us <laughs> because I want you to do the dishes but then she'll do it because I just want to get it done. And then I'm in trouble because I didn't do it quick enough. So the fact that she actually told me, I need you to tell me this was like, oh my gosh, that's a big deal for her. So it's scary to, to try to tell people, this is what I need. And I'm proud that you were able to tell me that. That was really good. One thing I've tried to do in that department with knowing that you need words of affirmation is to make bold statements when they're needed. And if you remember, we were at dinner pretty recently, just the two of us, and we've had a few people tell us this is not going to work, or this is extremely difficult, or I've seen this over and over again. It just leads to divorce. We were at dinner and, and Katie said to me, are, are we just fooling ourselves? Like I have all these, I have a bunch of people telling me that this is not going to work. And do you remember what I said to you? I said, I, I want to say something very shocking. And I oh, want to yeah. say something so that you understand if we ever get divorced, it's because you chose to leave me because I will never leave you. Enter and, the tears. <laughs> and then she starts crying. You said to me, well, I'll never leave you. I'll never leave you. And I said, well, then what are we worried about? There's nothing to worry about. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but we are committed to each other. Yes. I think that there are so many naysayers out there and especially during this process of doing a podcast. After the first episode, I said, are we just kidding ourselves? I mean, is this just something that we're doing right. to help us in the process and it, it's going to end up differently? And that is a fear of mine. But when he said that, I, of course, felt it and if it just felt good. We're committed to each other. So real talk. High five. High five. 
And we won't kiss on camera <laughs> or on mic. <laughs> yeah, ew. No one wants to hear that. <laughs> Good thing this isn't a video podcast. <laughs> the other thing that I have had just kind of like a real fear about, and I have a lot of um, irrational fears, a lot. I mean, what ifs, right? A very rational fear that I have had is that through this process, he would connect with someone else because I'm not listening to him or whatever it may be, but he will go to someone, another person who's a woman, and he will connect with them on an emotional level, and they will be supportive to him rather than me. That's something that happens a lot, is maybe not a physical affair, but an emotional affair where someone's really supporting you, and you feel connected to them in that way. And Alan didn't do that. Alan came to me, and that's how we're emotionally connected. And so, but that has been a fear of mine, is that he would find or seek support elsewhere. Yeah. It's, I don't know if I'm just confident or naive, but both. I, Katie and I went on a walk this morning and I was, I was on Reddit and I read a story about somebody that, that came out to his wife as, as having shifting beliefs and no longer believing. And they tried to make it work. They went to counseling and she ended up leaving him under the pretenses of this isn't what I signed up for. You promised to take me to the temple. You promised to take me to the celestial kingdom. And she left him because of it. I've never honestly, and this is kudos to you. I've never really had that concern. I know that you told me at the beginning four years ago, that was the only moment that you said, if you leave the church, I'm going to leave you. I look at my faith transition as the last 12 months. And there has not been one moment that I felt like we were at risk. There's been very hard moments and there's been sleep on the couch moments, but there hasn't been. I'm on the couch, by the way. Yeah. Cause it's a punishment to me. Like you, <laughs> you made me sleep on the couch. That's how much this is affecting me. And I'm like, no, no, I'll sleep on the couch. You sleep in the bed. It's reverse psychology here. Oh, it's torture. <laughs> <laughs> there has not been a couch night in quite some time. I can't even remember one. Recognizing those fears, voicing those fears. And talking about them. I mean, we could make these episodes very short by just saying, hey, it's episode five. We're going to talk about love. Uh, you need to talk to each other more. Like if that, okay, it's episode six. We're going to talk about going to the temple. You need to talk to each other more. But it, that's basically the, the punchline of every single episode is be open and communicate. And love is absolutely no different. Sharing your fears, sharing what's working, sharing your needs of I really need this more. It's been really helpful and we're not perfect with it at all, but it's, it's certainly improved. Yeah, it has improved. I said to someone the other day that I feel like our relationship is the best today than it has been in over a year and a half and maybe even longer because we're connecting on different levels. Right. It's taken a lot of time and work to get to that spot. It hasn't been easy. But we are in it together for the long haul. So thank you so much for listening to Marriage on a Tightrope. Oh, wait. Can I add one more thing? Uh, thank you for continuing to listen. Katie's got one more thing. <laughs> Just to end, we received an email from another listener who said that we were welcome to share this anonymously. So thanks for that out there. Thanks, Brian. I'm just kidding. I don't know his name. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't or know. her name. I don't even know. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. It's he, his wife, who is going through the, the faith transition. And when they sat down and talked about it, she said to him, you know, I thought that our relationship had deeper meaning than just the church. And I really like that sentiment. It goes along with what you said, Alan. And... He said, yeah, you're right. And then they were able to move forward. And it doesn't mean that they're not having a difficult time either. But when you can realize that, really, the heart of it, then you can move forward with your relationship. This is the first Marriage on a Tightrope homework assignment. Go find someone you love, preferably your spouse. <laughs> Kiss them, hug them, tell them you love them. Chocolate and flowers always help, too. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening to this early enough on Valentine's Day, it's not too late. Get to Walmart it's now. It's not too late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to Marriage on a Tightrope. We look forward to hearing uh, your feedback, marriageonatightrope at gmail.com or mormondiscussionpodcast.org. And we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>